Good morning. Um, this is uh, Joy Ackerman. Welcome to Antioch University, New England, and to the first webinar in our new series, Engaging Conservation Psychology for Effective Action. My name is Joy Ackerman, and I direct the Conservation Psychology Center at Antioch and serve as core faculty in the Environmental Studies Program. I'd like to start by acknowledging a key member in our conservation psychology community here, whose work in developing the field, initiating the first CPI, and designing our conservation psychology course here on campus have been instrumental in our center. Uh, Carol Saunders, um, Dr. Carol Saunders, has also been in instrumental in um, encouraging and initiating this webinar series. Next slide. Before we get to today's topic, I'd like to review some webinar logistics. Uh, everyone should be connected upon entering uh, the webinar. Today's presentation will be recorded and posted to the Antioch website within a week. And you'll also get a link uh, emailed to you if you registered for the uh, webinar. With me today is our uh, Consyc Center Coordinator, Terry Downing. If you need help, please use the chat section and send to the host. Next slide. Today's webinar topic um, will include a brief introduction uh, of the presentation of the speaker, uh, about a 20-minute presentation, and then time for audience questions. I encourage you to stay with us and please take the uh, exit survey at the end. It's really important in helping us uh, decide how we did uh, improve our practice and uh, get feedback to you on what else you'd like to, to learn about. Next slide, please. Before we start, I want to give a quick plug for our next webinar in the series, which will take place next month on April 26, Applying Conservation Psychology Theory and Principles. Two of our past Conservation Psychology Institute participants, Amy Wiedensall and Dr. Kim Langmaid, will be sharing how they applied the uh, learning from the Conservation Psychology Institute in their professional practice. Next slide. Speaking of the Conservation Psychology Institute, our next institute, which is a four-day uh, workshop type uh, Institute will be here on the Antioch University New England campus in Keene, New Hampshire from June 18th to 21st. Uh, you can use the link on the slide to check out more information and to register. Uh, it's a great way to network with other practitioners and with researchers uh, to bring your questions, uh, to bring a team from your organization, and to do some hands-on problem solving. Uh, in the context of this uh, learning opportunity. Next slide, please. So, hi everybody. This is Abby Abrash Walton, and I'm going to take over the presentation from here. And thanks, Joy. Um, I wanted to just get us started with a, a basic definition to understand what conservation psychology is. And what you see here is, um, is a definition developed by our colleague, Dr. Carol Saunders, in, in one of the seminal uh, early articles published about conservation psychology as this field was getting up and running. And what you see here is that conservation psychology is the scientific study of the reciprocal relationships between humans and the rest of nature, with a particular focus on how to encourage conservation of the natural world. So the originators of, of this applied field began with questions, questions like, how can we inspire people to care about the natural world and their role in it? How can we encourage people to live in more sustainable ways? And conservation psychology is specifically situated as an applied field that draws on psychological principles, theories, or methods to understand and solve issues related to human aspects of conservation. So CONPSYCH resides within the field of psychology for its theoretical framework and methodology, but the field collaborates with other disciplines and professionals in setting research questions and scope of work. 
near and dear to my heart and what drew me into being involved with our conservation psychology, psychology initiative here is that conservation psychology has a mission. And that mission is to promote conservation and sustainability. So at its core, conservation psychology is concerned with the ways in which human behavior affects environmental and social well-being. And the fundamental goal articulated by the founders is to promote a healthy and sustainable relationship between humans and the natural environment. So this values-based approach is consistent with other scientific endeavors, such as research in the fields of medicine, which of course focuses on human well-being, and also conservation biology, which focuses on environmental sustainability. And these are fields that aim to describe, examine, and advance particular outcomes. So there's a great kinship with uh, conservation biology and conservation psychology uh, was really conceptualized in many ways to uh, draw on what we can know about effectiveness in the realm of conservation biology. And so here you can see how uh, conservation biology is really uh, an, a field that draws on a lot of uh, sub-disciplines, sub-fields within the discipline. And if we superimpose conservation psychology over the top of conservation biology, you can see that both fields have the explicit goal of promoting conservation. They both involve dynamic collaborations between practitioners and researchers, and both draw, as I said, on subfields of the discipline to reach the goal of conservation. But beyond uh, that way of understanding conservation psychology, it's also really important to remember that in addition to being a field of study, Conservation psychology is also an actual network of researchers and practitioners working together. And um, it's that network that really uh, is so dynamic and such a part of what we, uh, what we build here through our Conservation Psychology Institute. Now, you might be wondering why study people? Um, a lot of my students in the Department of Environmental Studies here at Antioch uh, are really much more at ease and happier uh, engaging with species other than Homo sapiens. And so understanding why to study people when you're thinking about achieving important conservation and sustainability outcomes um, is an important question to ask. And here's a way of understanding answers to that question. First and foremost, because human behavior is really at the root of our most pressing environmental challenges. Secondly, because your work, and I, I'm imagining that all of you on this broadcast today are engaged with conservation or sustainability initiatives or want to be in some meaningful way, no matter what your work is or where you're working, your work is going to involve you with people and with society at large. So that's another key reason. Thirdly, because you want to engage and communicate effectively with your clients, your stakeholders, your visitors, your students, depending upon what, uh, what type of setting you're applying conservation psychology to. And lastly, because improving conservation and sustainability outcomes means leveraging social and individual change. So those are the reasons that, that we think about, about why conservation psychology and the study of conservation psychology is so important and why it's a part of our curriculum here uh, at Antioch University in the Department of Environmental Studies. So let's look next at conservation psychology content and skill areas, starting with nature, care, and connection. And this is really focusing on questions like, how do childhood and adult experiences correlate with or foster a sense of connection and care for nature? So environmental identity is one way to explore and communicate the strength and type of connections. Nature care is also reciprocal, as you saw from that first definition that I began with. Conservation psychology includes a focus on human health and well-being the health benefits of nature, and the relationships of biodiversity with human health. Secondly, and this is the core focus for me in my own work, 
conservation behavior? How do individual and social factors influence behavior? So conservation psychology draws on psychology constructs such as identity, beliefs, values, motivation, and self-efficacy to understand pro-environmental behavior and approaches individual behavior in social context through the lenses of social norms, social practice, and social marketing. And thirdly, effective messaging and communication. So how do our values and identity influence the information we pay attention to and our acceptance or dismissal of that information? Conservation psychology draws on communication theory to recommend strategies for effective pro-environmental messaging and conservation communication. So next I want to walk us through uh, a deeper understanding of areas of conservation psychology research. And what you can see here is that there are different uh, foci for research. You see these two columns, conservation behaviors and caring about and valuing nature. Joy and I were just um, talking earlier about the fact that we really want to build out this visual to include what you see up there in the right-hand corner, which is communication and engagement, um, and to add a third column there. And then across the rows on the left, you see that uh, areas of research might be focused specifically on individual level uh, engagement with conservation behaviors and caring about and valuing nature and um, and communication. It might also, uh, you see, as you see at that second row, be focused on group or organizational levels through collective action and social norms and discourses. And again, to build out this visual, what we'll be adding is a third row, which thinks about uh, research that's focused at a societal level. And then as you move along these different dimensions of research, moving back to front, you can see that there are different types of research that are uh, part of, encompassed by uh, research in the field of conservation psychology. First, you see theoretical research that is focused on developing conceptual models. There's the applied piece of research focused on identifying effective strategies and, of course, the evaluation dimension of research, which has to do with measuring success. So it's all well and good for us to engage in initiatives uh, with the goals of achieving better outcomes. How do we know that we've been successful? And so that evaluation component is, is very important. And the integrity of conservation psychology as a field of research and practice is really grounded in rigorous research. And, and Saunders, Carol Saunders, in proposing this new field, emphasized its applied nature and the value of enhancing connections between research and practice, between the social and natural sciences, and between psychology and other social sciences. So the field's success depends upon researchers' ability to identify theory, methods, and applied recommendations and techniques that yield demonstrable and effective sustainability outcomes. So next I wanted to share with you this quote. And um, there was a, a special issue of Human Ecology Review published in 2003, which brought together a number of different researchers and practitioners to really be thoughtful about conservation psychology as an emerging field. And this quote uh, was one that came from a practitioner who, who really, at the end of the day, I think, said what we all need to be mindful about as we pursue uh, research uh, in the field of conservation psychology, which is what conservation practitioners need are trained people, useful methods, and tested knowledge that they can use to improve their day-to-day -day work. So at the end of the day, uh, we know that we are being effective in terms of developing and advancing the field of conservation psychology if we're helping people to be more effective in, in achieving improved conservation and sustainability outcomes. 
So again, back to the starting question, why study conservation psychology? So I'm going to offer, in closing, four specific reasons. One is to understand the powerful social and psychological aspects that influence group and individual environmental actions and attitudes. Secondly, to be more effective in designing programs, crafting messages, and engaging individuals and organizations in conservation, sustainability, and climate change action. And thirdly, to appreciate and understand how you and others develop into people who connect with and care about nature. Lastly, to learn about social and psychological research methods and social marketing campaigns. So those are the focuses that we have in the coursework that we offer here, also in terms of the Conservation Psychology Institute. And um, I want to now turn it over to Joy to uh, see whether we've got some questions, uh, or maybe, Joy, you have some points that you'd like to make at this stage. But let's open it up after this introduction to why study conservation psychology. Hi, can everybody hear me? This yes. Is Joy. Um, I, I just see one question so far, um, which is from um, Jennifer, um, whether we'll be able to receive the slide presentation. Uh, you'll be receiving a tape of the webinar, so it will have uh, the slides as well as uh, the audio. Um, any other questions from our audience this morning? Please feel free to use the chat function to uh, type in a question. In teaching conservation psychology here, uh, one of the things I feel that I'm uh, doing for people is people who um, uh, come into um, uh, environmental work really focused on content and uh, put a lot of energy and passion into their work. And the tools of conservation psychology are a way that uh, their energy and passion can just have a farther reach and, and a greater effect. So Andrea is asking if we can repeat the four reasons to study conservation. Abby, can you take I, that on? I would, yes, I would love to repeat the four reasons. So um, first and foremost, to understand social and psychological aspects that influence group and individual environmental actions and attitudes. And secondly, and this is the one closest to my heart, to be more effective in the work that we do. So whether it's designing programs or crafting messages, designing campaigns, uh, engaging individuals and organizations in conservation and sustainability, and, and to a certain extent climate change action, that that is a key, uh, key reason. Thirdly, um, to appreciate and understand how you and others with whom you're engaging, with whom you might be uh, working uh, in terms of conservation and sustainability initiatives, develop into people who connect with and care about nature. And fourthly, to learn about social and psychological research methods and social marketing campaigns. And I'll just add to that that you know, my background is not in psychology. I uh, am a highly interdisciplinary um, scholar and practitioner and did work uh, for more than a decade in the field of uh, international human rights and the nexus of human rights and environmental concerns and transitioned from doing that work into focusing on sustainability and conservation initiatives uh, within organizations. And the work that I've just completed in terms of research was focused on the phenomenon of institutional fossil fuel divestment. So this whole notion of you know, what's motivating uh, organizational leaders to commit to uh, selling off, to divesting all of their fossil fuel holdings within their stock portfolios. And I specifically positioned that study within the field of conservation psychology and also leadership studies because I found that to answer the questions that I had in terms of my research, 
it was most beneficial for me to draw on, uh, in this case, the trans-theoretical model of behavior change, which is an integrative psychological um, model that comes out of uh, more than 30 years of, of empirical research and has been uh, used to examine more than 50 different behaviors globally. And that model, for me, offered me the, the theoretical framework uh, and the conceptual modeling that advanced my analysis of my data, that really helped me to make sense of the phenomenon that was at the core of my study. So really looking at, you know, hearkening back to some of those, those key constructs from psychology, um, questions about self-efficacy and what really promoted or supported these organizational leaders' sense that they were able to engage in this new and highly unconventional behavior of divesting um, their stock assets. So I was looking at investing behavior within an organizational setting, looking too at motivations for why they would do this, looking at the processes that facilitated their ability to be successful in moving from contemplating taking on this unconventional investing behavior to preparing to engage in it, to actually doing it, and then over the course of, of time, maintaining that behavior within the organizational settings in which they were leading, within the, the sector in which they exist, which is philanthropy, and uh, more broadly, just at a societal level in terms of you know, how we are typically um, socialized to understand what makes sense as part of a responsible and um, high-performing uh, investment portfolio. So for me, as a researcher, uh, conservation psychology actually was a portal through which I could gain access to um, theories, methods, conceptual models that were very resonant for me in terms of answering questions that you know, I might have at a different point in my career uh, attempted to answer through um, the lens of uh, economic decision making or um, other types of, of ways of understanding the question. So I share that with the idea of just giving people a sense of, you know, how mm -hmm. How you can how you can uh, sort of find your way through conservation psychology and and make it relevant for the work you're doing. That's one example. Thanks, Abby. Um, I thought we'd move on to the next question um, from Karina. She appreciated the graphic that included areas of conservation psychology research when working within the evaluative dimension, the one that includes measurement. How do you assess both individual and group level behaviors? That's really a great question. Um, in working with uh, the students in my master's class in conservation psychology, uh, each of them engages in their own self-change project uh, for the first half of the semester while we're studying theory around behavior change. And one of the uh, findings that most students have through that is how social uh, their behavior is, what they thought was individual, perhaps eating more vegetarian meals, for example, um, turns out to actually have a lot of social factors. So I think it's really important to study um, both and. Um, one of the ways that uh, I've seen this um, studied um, in uh, some of the research papers that we use in class uh, is through studying uh, in surveys of individual responses, but in the context of a group process. Uh, for example, um, having a lesson on reducing toxics for high school students, uh, which is lecture only, and then having another lesson for a different group, same information, but it includes discussion, and that allows for uh, some understanding of the social aspect or the social normative aspect of it. Um, we've also looked at some studies that engage social practice theory and look at how um, environmental behavior changes in the workplace where the practices of uh, the organization, such as recycling or energy use, 
uh, are implemented, but then there is follow-up of um, individuals in terms of their own values and whether those values have changed. Abby, I don't know if you want to add anything to that question. Well, it's a, it's a great question, and it's uh, key. Uh, and I'm thinking about... Um, I'm thinking about what we can know from from reviews through the lens of conservation psychology, and I think a lot of the challenge often with a lot of research is that it's uh, based on self-reported behaviors, and it's not triangulated with um, data that looks at actual outcomes. And so um, I'm thinking about researchers who are doing interesting work in that space. And I'm thinking about um, people like Wes Schultz, who has uh, joined us as faculty for the Conservation Psychology Institutes in the past. And some of the, some of the methods, some of the research designs that he uses for actually um, measuring uh, the effectiveness of different types of um, community-based social marketing campaigns. And, um, you know, it's those kinds of studies and those types of resources that, that you know, people who come into the CPI experience, uh, we like to connect them with. So um, there's some interesting research that's being done. That's, that's some that comes to mind from my perspective. Thanks, Abby. Um, Mahami Griffith asks, uh, for someone new to this field, aside from the webinar, could you please recommend some good resources and reading to get started with? Um, I sure can. Um, again, I, I sort of take an academic approach to this, but since our students are not coming in as psychology majors and we are orienting both the CPI and the class to people in environmental studies in general, uh, we don't start out with um, requirements that people first get psychology degrees and then study conservation psychology. Um, we use uh, the second edition of the book Conservation Psychology by Susan Clayton and Jean Myers as a class textbook. And uh, this has uh, chapters that present what I would think of as sort of literature reviews on uh, various topics. And so it's uh, fairly dense but comprehensive and accessible. Uh, I also use a book design for undergraduates written by Thomas Heberling called Navigating Environmental Attitudes. And um, uh, Thomas uh, taught at the University of Wisconsin-Madison for many years. He draws a lot on Aldo Leopold, on Attitudes Toward Wolves, on um, uh, energy conservation research that he's done. And it's a very fun and accessible read that puts the effort to change um, individuals, what he calls the cognitive approach, um, in context with other approaches like technological or structural fixes. Uh, Nikki Hare, who was uh, on Abby's uh, doctoral um, uh, committee, uh, has a lovely, uh, very accessible book called Psychology for Sustainability, which is available as a free download uh, from her website. She's at the University of Auckland. And, uh, I've also drawn on some chapters from another textbook, the fourth edition of Psychology for Sustainability by Britton Scott, Elise Amel, Susan Coger, and Christy Manning. Again, very accessible, um, more kind of in the um, psychology discipline uh, tradition, but very uh, helpful. I use the chapter on how we know what we know uh, to help people understand social uh, research. So those are some, some good ideas. There are also a host of um, resources that Abby and I use that are um, put out um, into the public domain by various nonprofits and named at practitioners. And uh, perhaps we might do a, a webinar or create a resource uh, on these um, uh, reviews for practitioner resources in the future. Any additions, Abby? I think that's a great idea to do a follow-up on this. I, I will also just say, as, as you did earlier, that the next webinar in this series is going to feature uh, some of the past participants, the alums from the Conservation Psych Institutes uh, in the past, and, and how they've actually been applying uh, what they got from conservation psychology to the practitioner work that they're doing. 
All right, so Deb has a question. I noticed in one of the graphics, eco-psychology is listed as a component of conservation psychology. I'm wondering about the key differences between the two. That's a great question, too, um, and I get that uh, question a lot. What is eco-psychology? How does it differ from conservation psychology? Uh, one of the key differences, I think, is the mission focus. Conservation psychology has a mission uh, that focuses more broadly on um, conserving uh, wildlife, biodiversity, on uh, um, enhancing sustainability, uh, whereas eco-psychology tends to have a therapeutic mission uh, aimed at um, individual well-being and how to foster um, individual well-being, um, usually mental health uh, and well-being through um, relationship with nature. Um, it also uh, has in the past and uh, currently um, there are people who work in eco-psychology that um, I would say diverge a little bit from our definition of conservation psychology as a scientific study. Um, not that their research isn't um, uh, well organized, well thought out, and um, uh, directed toward creating new knowledge, uh, but it, it crosses over into the transcendental and transpersonal into areas in which scientific study doesn't go. Uh, and so um, questions of sp spirituality or consciousness, uh, for example. So I think it has to do with what we can measure um, and what we can know in ways that uh, are not um, quantitatively measured. I hope that helps, Deb. That was a great response. So Adam has a question. Have practitioners used psychoanalytic methods to develop a model of human preferences concerning conservation? Gosh, Adam, I don't, I don't know how to answer that. Um, psychoanalytic methods. Um, I guess I would need to know more about what you mean by that because I'm not coming from psychology either. Um, what we do know about human preferences concerning conservation and where we often focus in our classroom and in the institute has to do with the uh, uh, social context uh, from which people are coming to conservation, uh, particularly uh, values, um, uh, political identity, religious identity, uh, the groups that people associate with have a lot to do with how they think about uh, whether conservation is needed, what conservation is for, uh, and um, really gives us uh, some strategies and tools to use that help us understand uh, the way we reach out to all groups of people. We all share this planet. Uh, we all want clean water. We all want clean air. Um, and how do we uh, share um, a, um, a message about uh, something like climate change or pollution reduction or species protection that really speaks to uh, speaks the language, the values and identity language of our audience. I hope that helps. <clears throat> Andrea says if you could recommend one to two books or resources. Um, I think uh, we covered some of that, and it sounds like uh, we'll get back to that maybe in the next. Uh, a webinar, uh, we could add a resource list to the slides, or we could do a webinar on that. Yeah, okay. I mean, just just uh, to your point, Joy, I, going back to the the um, resources that you already named, um, you know, certainly the conservation psychology uh, text by Clayton and Myers is an outstanding place to start for people who are new to the field and just want to get um, both a, a deep as well as a broad understanding. Yeah, and I'm just grabbing um, a publication called Influencing Conservation Action, What Research Says About Environmental Literacy, Behavior, and Conservation Results, which is a nice handbook that's been put together by um, a number of different organizations, NAAEE, um, Together Green, Audubon, and a couple of other organizations. And I think if you uh, just put influencing 
conservation action into a Google search, you could probably come up with that and find that as a, a PDF. Uh, I think it's something you could get people uh, to look through. Uh, it has one to two page articles on a variety of different uh, areas. <coughs> So Emily asks, is there a date planned for an updated website? That's a great question, uh, Emily. There is um, or was a conservation psychology website. Um, I'll be meeting with Carol Saunders today, and uh, we'll, I'll, I'll try to find out what's going on with that and, uh, and uh, let folks know in the future. Um, she also asks how we can best join the network of other individuals working in the conservation psychology field. A long time ago, this was through the website and email list. Uh, there is a, a currently a conservation psychology list serve, and uh, uh, perhaps uh, Terry can send out the information on that um, with uh, the uh, link to this webinar. Um, yeah, that would be great. The CPI is also a great way to. Um, uh, connect with other practitioners. Uh, it's uh, less formal than uh, a website, but we do have a social uh, networking site for all past participants of the CPI, and it's a great way to get connect, uh, connected. Okay, Jennifer, can you re please repeat the first book title? That was Conservation Psychology. Clayton and Myers. Yep. And the subhead for that is understanding and promoting human care for nature. Sounds like some folks have been having uh, problems with the audio. I apologize for that. This is uh, our first run, and we'll do what we can to find out what's going on with the systems and uh, improve that. And another great reason to do the exit survey at the end, right? So you can please let us know if you did experience technical challenges with this broadcast. Okay, so it uh, looks like um, a couple more questions have been posted and Terry sharing them with us. Um, you know, Soros has a question. I work on human wildlife conflict in the Bolivian Amazon. Many of the issues with conflict are related with fear toward a specific species, fear that is sometimes unfounded. How can we work to change this? Mm, that's, that, a that's a great question. Um, you know, we, um, one of the reasons that Carol Saunders came to us to uh, foster um, a place for reaching out to practitioners with conservation psychology uh, information and training was because we do have a robust conservation biology department and many of our graduate students and some of our faculty work in this important area of human wildlife conflict. Uh, some of them work in the area of um, understanding um, uh, these uh, issues around fear and maybe working to uh, develop programs to build understanding and empathy uh, with uh, um, local people. Um, a number of our students come from uh, uh, countries outside the U.S. where uh, biodiversity is uh, rich but also very threatened. And so uh, the, the risks from wildlife are real risks to life and livelihood. And so uh, some of uh, the work, the research that goes on, uh, is work to uh, identify um, say, uh, livestock predation um, reduction strategies such as uh, automatic lighting uh, uh, and things like that. Uh, so I think there are a variety of strategies uh, to use. Some of them involve working uh, with the community itself and building um, understanding. Uh, some of them uh, involve uh, developing uh, capacity among uh, local people to engage in the work of conservation with their uh, colleagues and peers and um, fellow citizens, uh, and some of them involve developing technological solutions uh, to uh, support um, the um, shift in attitudes uh, to both 
uh, reduce the harm that wildlife um, might inflict on life and livelihood, at the same time creating a greater understanding of the patterns of wildlife behavior and greater empathy for what the needs uh, of the wildlife are uh, to uh, you know, sort of foster an enlarged sense of identity and community. Another question is, how do you see conservation psychology relating to social marketing or community-based social marketing? And what tools are used in conservation psychology for evaluation of impact? You want to handle that one, Abby? Yeah, it's very similar to one of the earlier questions that we had uh, on this broadcast. And, and there again, I mean, uh, community-based social marketing is a core approach that, uh, that we cover in the Conservation Psychology Institute and um, really drawing on the work of a few uh, key folks out there in the research landscape. Wes Schultz, whom I mentioned earlier, has done really interesting research uh, using these types of approaches, focusing on uh, facilitating pro-environmental behavior change. And Doug McKenzie Moore is another uh, another lead researcher and, and uh, you know, writer on this whose work we draw on. So um, there are some very specific uh, design approaches for constructing a community-based social marketing campaign. And, you know, I, that's sort of a, a whole other topic that, um, that could be explored. Uh, but I'll just say that I think... Um, What's important to remember with designing those types of interventions, those kinds of campaigns, is there's one central question you have to begin with, and that question is, what is it specifically that you want to facilitate the change of? So what specific behavior do you want to shift? Um, so sometimes answering that question uh, can be challenging. Um, sometimes it's very straightforward, but you always need to start there. And then um, there is a specific approach to uh, to taking uh, that as the launch pad for designing effective interventions in, in sometimes a very iterative process. That's a great answer, Abby. Um, we draw on conservation uh, or on community-based social marketing in our self-change projects in the class. And one of the challenges for students is um, figuring out how their chosen behavior might be more divisible. Uh, for for community-based social marketing, having um, a non-divisible behavior as your target behavior is really important. And one of my students said, well, I want to take reusable bags to the grocery store. That's a non-divisible behavior because either you do it or you don't. And I said, well, not my experience. In my experience, first, I have to get reusable bags. Then I have to put them somewhere that will allow them to end up at the store. And then I have to take them in the store with me. So there are many places in which um, that intention of not using disposable bags uh, can be challenged by uh, uh, memory, habit, convenience, uh, and so forth. Um, so it's a great strategy. Um, but, exactly, uh, it's, it's and very, very specific. And one of the things that yeah. we're learning is that if there are ways that you can avoid, depending on individual behavior change, uh, to create a default behavior uh, that that doesn't require human decision making or action, uh, you can uh, also create um, conservation uh, outcomes that are very effective. Yeah, and I love the plastic bag example, Joy, because uh, there there are different structural fixes to that, right? As Heberlin would say, there are different ways to approach that. And you know, the policy um, the policy person in me loves the example of the government of Rwanda, which simply outlawed plastic bags. <laughs> that was one that was one way of taking it out of the the um, sphere of individual choice, um, but also those other types of, uh, of structural fixes where you're structuring the path for uh, supporting the type of pro-environmental behavior that you, you want to um, see more of. You know, the idea of 
um, shop owners providing boxes, providing reusable bags. Um, but th these are the kinds of questions that, through conservation psychology, it's really exciting to be thinking about. You know, where are the most important places to intervene? You know, if you think back to that uh, conceptual model that um, looks at the different columns and rows uh, for areas of research, when you're thinking about a specific uh, outcome that you're trying to achieve, where's where might you most usefully um, focus your inquiry and structure your, your interventions? So I think there's a, a, a follow-up to the question about um, working with uh, wildlife um, attitudes and behaviors. And this is, do you think um, the best approach for introducing psychology would be training biologists or uh, other scientists people in conservation psychology or to attract more psychologists to work in the conservation biology area. Um, I, again, I think both and. I, I think that uh, one of the things that distinguishes conservation biology as an interdisciplinary field is uh, the fact that it does have an influence and integration of the social aspects, uh, uh, the human aspects of conservation uh, within its realm. Um, and uh, I think that um, as an interdisciplinary scholar like Abby, uh, one of the things that we know in working in the environmental field is how complex the problems uh, are. And I think it's important that most scholars know at least how to communicate across some of these disciplinary divides uh, so that we know how to access the information that other people are provided. But we also need interdisciplinary teams of scholars, people with uh, deep expertise and skill in different disciplines uh, who are able and willing to work together in uh, a mission-focused way. That's one of the reasons it's so exciting for me to uh, be part of the Environmental Studies Department here at Antioch because we are an interdisciplinary department and I've become a better educator by working with people whose specialty is education. I've understood more about the science of advocacy uh, from working with people who really understand policy and social change. Uh, I'm always learning more about the natural world uh, from our biologists and the problems that they face. And so it's, uh, it's very exciting. Um, you never feel like you know enough, um, but uh, it's a, a great opportunity to uh, bring the skills that you have to a larger community, whether that's in teaching uh, students or doing research together as um, uh, part of an interdisciplinary team. That's the last question I see, and it's about 12.51. I'd like to encourage you to um, uh, take our survey. Abby, is that on the um, uh, link on the last slide for that? No, it should just pop up for folks as they exit okay. out of the, the WebEx platform. Well, thank you all very much for joining us. I do apologize if the audio was not sufficient. We'll um, like to get your feedback on what your experience was in terms of uh, the quality of the delivery as well as the content of the webinar. And let us know what you'd like to hear um, about uh, in more depth in future webinars. Uh, and certainly feel free to uh, look us up on our Antioch University New England website and email us individually if you have questions about our programs. Uh, you'll find the link to the CPI registration in one of the slides, and uh, Terry will include that link in the uh, email of this webinar. Thank you again for joining us. <laughs>